Tonight on In The Loop, a wide-ranging and candid conversation with a pop culture icon as he takes on a new role. I, I'm a storyteller, that's what I do. Plus, we explore the world's biggest contest for spelling with some seriously smart kids. I make sure to study minimum four hours to six hours a day. I overheard heard the last interview and just said four to six hours, and I'm, I'm like, I thought I was doing a lot. <laughs> This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant, and this is the Scripps National Spelling Bee. More than 200 kids from around the world gather to compete in a spelling contest that's been running for almost a century now. As always, these child geniuses are the stars of the show, but this year, they're joined by a host who brings his own star power, actor and author LeVar Burton. For many, LeVar is known for his iconic roles in series like Roots and Star Trek, but for a certain generation of fans, including myself, his name is synonymous with reading and, well, with words. Which makes his move to join the Spelling Bee a natural fit. In the lead up to the Spelling Championship Finals, I got the chance to go behind the scenes with LeVar at the Bee and chat with him about the new job and reflections on a career in pop culture. First and foremost, thank you so much for your time. There you go. <laughs> I, uh, I gotta say congrats. On the new gig, I mean, this is this is you know, pretty big. You're you're going to be a part of this thing that's been going on for a while. It's the oldest educational contest in America, right? And that's no small thing to me. Mm -hmm. um, there are great and wonderful traditions in this country, and this is one that I caught hold of early on. So I have followed the spelling bee for a long time. Not a great speller, I'll be honest with you, straight up. Thank you for being candid, yes. I am yes. not a great speller. I can read, I can read. But nobody's asking you, like, spell this. I'm not a great speller. My wife is, is, is a great speller and the best proofreader I know. But I, you know, I rely on experts. Um, I admire these kids an awful lot. I call them intellectual athletes. Mm -hmm because that's exactly what they are. They train for this, they're, they're, they're focused on it. Um, they're serious about this competition. And I am a fan of excellence in all of its aspects and, and, and forms and faces. And this is excellence, uh, you know, personified. So I'm very, very psyched I got this call. You seem uniquely qualified for something <laughs> like this. I, I think for starters, you, you're not you're not B master. You're host. Right. Host of what does a host do? I really feel like I have been asked to be here to help share the stories of the contestants. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a storyteller. That's what I do, and I'm hoping to bring that aspect of me to 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 these proceedings because you know they deserve to have their stories told, right? It wouldn't, you watch any kind of athletic competition, you know, the Olympics. Uh, it's the personal stories that draw you in. You begin to care about the athletes, right? You begin to root for your favorites. That's what this is about. That's By the time we get to the finals, I will know all of the children, all of their stories. And you, and you will have your favorites, mm -hmm. those that you are really rooting for to advance. Um, it's very cool. I can tell that you are excited about this because, I mean, it seems like such a good fit. I, I, I want to go back some and say, you know, when, when did you get that call? And what was said to you? Like, you know, LeVar, we have, the, we have your next gig right here. Like, what was, what was that phone call? Like? Well, it, it happened in, in the same time frame, if not the same week, that... Um, that I was not named the host of the game show that shall not be named. Um, and so to get the call from Scripps Spelling Bee about hosting um, this tournament was <sighs> huge balm um, on an open wound. And I thought, ah, well, at least they see me. Mm -hmm. They see me. They see me. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely one to go where I'm wanted and loathe to go where I'm not invited. I like that we're, we're giving that game show the Voldemort routine right now. <laughs> well, 
the truth is, <laughs> I, I, it was my favorite game show. Mm -hmm. It really was. I mean, I, I, I watched that show since I was in the third grade, and Art Fleming was the host. And I honestly thought that I, I was well suited for it. Mm -hmm. um, as it turns out, it really wasn't a competition. After all, the fix was in. But I, That's all right. I really want to get some reflections from you on this because I feel like there's definitely mm, an opportunity for a takeaway. Maybe other people mm -hmm. um, are looking at you know something that they want or something that they think they want, right. and realizing maybe it's not a good fit. Maybe this isn't you know the right thing for me after all. Now that we have some distance from that game show, I'm kind of curious if you don't mind kind of giving us some of your takeaways in terms of, you know, having a thing, wanting it, and then it not ultimately not being for you. Yeah. Well, th there are a lot, and, and I, I, I believe I'm still mining some of the takeaways from that experience. First and foremost, I'm a firm believer in betting on myself, and I would encourage anyone uh, and everyone out there to, to believe similarly in themselves. I'm always going to bet on me. Always. Bet on black, baby. <laughs> right? Because I trust myself to get it done at the end of the day. Having said that, sort of experience, not sort of, experiencing a very public defeat, humiliation, if you will, was sobering. And what I learned from the experience, really, is that it reinforced my belief that everything happens for a reason. Even if you cannot discern the reason in the moment, in the fullness of time, everything will be revealed. And like I said, it was I think in that first week of, of feeling really sort of, um, not just disappointed, but wrecked. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't expect that I would not be their choice for host. And the doors have been opened, windows have been opened, the phone hasn't stopped ringing. And, and I never would have experienced those things that I'm experiencing, like hosting the script spelling bee, had I gotten that job. So um, I think it's a, it was a big lesson for me in just being willing to sit in the discomfort long enough to find out what was really supposed to happen for me around this game show thing. You know, a couple of years ago, I realized that I am firmly in the category of elder now. And it's my turn to share whatever benefit of the experience, the lived experience that I've had with, with you know, with those that are, are coming up behind me. I, People did it for me. My very first day as an actor, Cicely Tyson played my mother. Dr. Maya Angelou played my grandmother. I was schooled when I shot Roots. I was a 19-year-old college sophomore, and they taught me everything I know in terms of being a professional. Right? They gave me my foundation. And like I said, it's, it's simply my turn. That's a flex, man. That's, that's truly a flex. <laughs> oh, 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 she says Cicely Tyson, you know, Maya Angelou. And the, and the way... You don't think you, I love you, saying that? Yeah. Are you kidding? You're a poet, man. The way that came out was just so smooth. I, I want to talk about blackness for a second. Sure. Um, you have some real bipartisan appeal, right? You're like Dolly Parton. Mm. People from all walks of life look at you and say, like, you know, you are one of the most recognizable black men in pop culture. Um, tell me a bit about how you see yourself and whether, you know, that's something that you know you're bringing into, into each and every role, because it, it, it is you. Tell me a bit about how you see yourself as a black man who is just so recognizable and has been a part of pop culture for decades now, man. My, um, one of my main motivating factors has always been uh, to make my family proud, right? Inversely, to not embarrass my family, That's right? That's important. It's really important. My mother was an English teacher. We're educators. And I know 
for certain in my heart that our family's ancestors see me standing where I stand. A couple of generations ago, it would have been illegal for me to know how to read. Do you feel me? Mm -hmm. And now, at this stage in my life, I am a symbol in this country for childhood literacy. The weight. I, it's, I feel it. It's I feel not it in the a exhale. weight. It's not a weight. Mm. It's like we're here, right? They never wanted us to be here. Some of them are mad that we are here, but we're not going anywhere. We're here, and we're not going anywhere. And we are showing up for excellence in every opportunity we get, because that's what we do. That's what we do. I've noticed uh, you, know, you said something in, a, in, in previous interviews about being able to tell where you know, certain generations of people know you from. <laughs> you say, oh, I know they know me from Roots. Mm -hmm. That's a Star Trek crowd right there. Mm -hmm. These folks here, reading, reading Rambo. Rambo. Yeah. And the theme song I absolutely love. I've been, <laughs> I've been imitating it. Have like, you been oh, singing we, it all week? <laughs> it's just, it's the opening phrases that I really love. Butterfly in the sky. I can go twice as high. Take a look. It's in a book. The Reading Rainbow. <laughs> You're a singer too? Well, uh, <laughs> no, not really. Ask my family. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you're so recognizable because of, because of these roles. And I think it's, it's really fun to kind of look ahead for a moment and mm -hmm. say, so many generations know you from, you know, these, your, your work with these different mm -hmm. um, I call them shows. tent poles. Tent poles. They are tent poles yeah, in, these of my career. Tent poles. Yeah. You know, what, what is it that, future generations will recognize you for? And what is it you want to be recognized for? Wow. That's a good question, Christian. I, I think if I were to be remembered as the guy who just wanted kids to read, I'd be good with that, you know? Um, that would be a fantastic legacy. Um, I do believe that Roots will probably well, between Roots and Star Trek and Reading Rainbow, I, I don't know, but I suspect that Reading Rainbow will be the first line of my obit, I think. I'm not sure. I won't be around to see, so it really doesn't matter. Um, but I think Reading Rainbow, it, it, because at this point, most of the adult population of a certain age, 40 and, and, and under, they all grew up on the show. And, and it's a sweet spot of their childhood, so it's a really emotional connection that I have with your generation. Um, and I, I treasure that. I really feel like I had a hand in helping to raise y'all, you know? Um, Uncle LeVar, uh, that's what I say. And I'm proud of you guys. <laughs> I am proud of you, the human beings that you have turned out to be, right? Conscious, aware, caring. On the day we spoke, LeVar had a busy schedule. Right before speaking with us, he was visiting Dr. Jill Biden at the White House. Dr. Biden has been an educator for over 30 years and is still working in the classroom in addition to her duties as First Lady. Dr. Biden has a phenomenal story. She's a speller. She's a great speller. Mm -hmm. and, and as we might, you know, surmise, she's an English teacher. And she won her sixth grade class spelling bee. And when it was time to advance to the next level, she was so nervous to be up in front of a lot of people that she feigned illness. So she didn't have to go. She was really kind of afraid of putting herself out there. And I loved her story because it, one of the reasons why she told it was to encourage kids to take more risks in their lives. It's an intimidating environment. My, my message would be have fun. Try and let go of all of that external stuff. You're here for a reason. You have proven yourself time and time again. Otherwise, you would not be here in this moment. Have fun. You've done all the hard work. You've done all the studying. Now you just get to do what it is you do, what you excel at. 
And so often, you know, we get into a situation like this where there's a lot, there are, are a lot of unfamiliar elements, and we allow them to sort of freak us out. Uh, just know that you belong here. You're here for a reason. And you don't want it, you don't want the experience to be done without even having enjoyed a moment of it. Yes, it's stressful. Yes, it's high tension. But please, just make sure you enjoy it. Wise words from the man himself. Much appreciated to LeVar Burton for taking the time to chat with us. And we've got a lot more to show you from the B. Still to come, a deep dive into the wild history around the contest. Plus, we hear from some kid contestants who could definitely spell circles around me. Not a hard task, but I'm trying to emphasize their intellect. We'll see you in just a few. Welcome back, folks. By the end of Tuesday, only 88 spellers remained in the Scripps National Spelling Bee. The competition is tough, and if you can't tune in live, just follow along on Twitter. We want to warn you, though, whoever is managing the Scripps B account isn't taking any breaks at all, just nonstop updates from a diligent human or humans. As the competition continues, we wanted to highlight some of the spellers we had a chance to chat with. Mind you, this was Monday before things kicked off, so the kids were feeling, well, I'll let them tell you. Nervous, very nervous. I'm feeling very excited and nervous at the same time. I feel very excited. This is my first time in the Scripps National Spelling Bee. It's an opportunity to achieve what I want most. I've competed before. I was in the fifth grade B, but then I got out like the school level. Sixth grade, I got second place in regionals. And then now in seventh grade, I, uh, I won regionals and I'm here at the nationals. I'm just trying to do as best as I can, but it will be great to work. I've studied the uh, Webster's, um, the third new international dictionary for it. A lot and a lot of study. That's the way I study. I look at the definition of the word. I look at the, the I look at the meaning. I look at the history of the word. And like, if it's something like, I don't know, imaret, and like it's an architectural term, I'll keep that in my brain, and then I can like refer to it. Well, I make sure to study minimum four hours to six hours a day. I, I overheard the last interview and she said four to six hours, and I'm, I'm like, I thought I was doing a lot. I never really had like a schedule, usually like an hour and a half, an hour to two hours usually. And we get a couple lists of a bunch of words, there's over like 2,000 or something, and we we just go over them and write them down and try to spell them and do their definitions. Then I'd have my little sister or my dad quiz me for each word. I read a lot and then I get my mom sometimes to read through a list and then I spell them back to her. Uh, not really worried, but all the double letter words are pretty tricky. Rhizome, because I, it's R-H-I-Z-O-M-E, but it always seems like a shovel Y in it. What is what is a rhizo? <laughs> I think multiplication got me out in fifth grade. I, don't, I just lost my train of thought, and I was like, and I think I put an S instead of an I, instead of a T, so I lost my train of thought. Do you want a chance at redemption? Yeah, I got it. M U L T I P L I C A T I O N multiplication. I'm pretty sure that's right. If it's not, then I'm. <laughs> I got trouble. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This will oh, be great. I hope I get multiplication. It's on a correxis, because that's the word I spelled to get here in the regional spelling bee. How do you spell it? O N Y C H O R R H E X I S. Can you use it in a sentence? No. I have two, actually. Okay, let's hear it. The first one is epistemophilia, spelled E-P-I-S-T-E-M-O-P-H-I-L-I-A. It means love of knowledge. And the second word is kata, K-A-T-A, -A, a set of exercises and body movements in judo. Right now, my favorite word to spell is pugilist. P-U-G-I-L-I-S-T. And it means like a boxer or a fighter, yeah. 
What is your favorite word to spell? Um, uh, my name, I guess. <laughs> you want to spell it out for us today? <laughs> M-A-X-I-M-I-L-I-A-N. And are you going to win? Um, yes. Yes! yes. <laughs> Good. We are wishing the best of luck to all the remaining kids. Hope y'all have your fidget spinners and stress balls handy. We're going to take a quick break so I can think about what went wrong early on in my life and how it's tied to not being able to make it out of my own classroom spelling bee. When we're back, we're diving into the nearly century old tradition and looking at how it's grown into the spectacle it is today. Welcome back, folks. The B is back and in full swing after last year's part in-person, part virtual competition because of the pandemic, of course. But this is a tradition that goes back almost a century, and a lot has changed in that time. Since the kids already schooled me with their vocab, we thought we'd give you a little lesson on how this whole thing came to be. The B has been around since 1925. Back then, nine newspapers got together to sponsor the first event. The first winner was an 11-year-old from Kentucky who spelled the word gladiolus correctly. In an extremely slumdog millionaire turn of events, the kid knew the word because he had raised the flower back home. He won $500 worth of gold pieces as an award. Nowadays, the semifinalists get a $500 gift card. The finalists? get a few thousand dollars, and the champion gets 50 grand, the trophy, of course, more money, and a reference library from Merriam-Webster, and more gifts from Encyclopedia Britannica, including a 1768 replica set. Now, there have been a few times when the B did not buzz. From 1943 to 1945, there was no B because of World War II. Can you guess the only other time it was canceled? 2020, when the pandemic first began. In 2019, the B had to deal with an eight-way tie. The judges quite literally ran out of words, which is not a thing I knew could even happen. Since then, the B has added a lightning round. If there are still multiple spellers left standing by the final round, they'll be given 90 seconds to spell out as many words as possible from a prepared list. Whoever spells the most words correctly wins. After a year-long hiatus because of the pandemic, the B returned last year with another first. Zaila Avant-Garde became the first Black American to be crowned winner of the B. She won in round 18 for spelling the word Muria right. In case you were wondering, it's a genus of tropical Asiatic and Australian trees having pinnate leaves and flowers with imbricated petals, so it's a plant. But Zaila was picturing something different when she won. Do you know Mary's face? I like, I just got there at Maria and I just thought of his face and it was, and it was so funny to me. <laughs> Millions of kids fight for the chance to make it to the Scripps National Spelling Bee. This year, it began with 234. By the end of day one, 88 spellers remained. The first few rounds consist of oral competition and one round of multiple choice word meaning. As it turns out, it's not just spelling, folks. An incorrect answer in any of those rounds will get you an automatic elimination and a ding. The B has become more than just a competition. Today, it is live streamed and tweeted about, which is very different than when it first started. I mean, TVs and ESPN weren't around back then, clearly. But the B has become a nationwide spectacle. National correspondent Maya Rodriguez shows us how it got to be so popular. It's the first Scripps National Spelling Bee since the pandemic that the preliminary and semifinal competitions are back in person. That means there are hundreds of students and their families here for the competition, which has only grown in reputation over the years. S K When spelling is your passion. E U O M O R P H Skewomorph. That's correct. There is no better place to unleash a P A N than on this stage. I L L. Welcome to the Scripps National Spelling Bee. That's 
I would say I am a good speller. I am not the caliber of these spellers. Meet Mary Brooks. <laughs> so that's my job. <laughs> head judge for the B. I a onychophagia. That's correct. Congratulations. She's worked for the bee since 1971. I've been able to reflect on the past 50 years. The kids are basically the same. Word meaning? The competition itself holds that same esteem. It's certainly gotten much more media exposure. But what has changed is their access to technology. As well as the bee's popularity. It has become just something that is revered and it's one of the few academic competitions for people, young people of this age, to actually pursue. Adjective from Latin. Students here come not just from across the country, but from around the world, with competitors this year coming from places like Canada, the Bahamas, Germany, and Ghana. And the way in which it has gone out there viral, I mean, there's very few people, A, that you can mention the National Spelling Bee that don't know about it, or B, you just say the word spelling bee, and almost everybody has some instant reaction action to it. And for these spellers, that can range from the drama of disappointment. The correct answer is C. To the buzz of success. OBIA chorophobia. That's correct. At National Harbor near Washington, DC. Thank you. I'm Maya Rodriguez. As we've seen so far in this episode, the Scripps National Spelling Bee has a lot of history behind it. And while a lot has changed in the last couple of decades, one thing has stayed the same since 2003. That would be Jacques Bailey, the Bee's official pronouncer. He's the guy who records word pronunciations that students use to practice, reads each word in the competition, and announces the winner each year. Karthik Nemani, if you spell this next word correctly, we will declare you the 2018 Scripps National Spelling Bee champion. You might call him the Bee Master. As an eighth grader, Bailey won the spelling bee himself after the runner up misspelled glitch. I guess personal computers and the spinning wheel of death that came with them weren't common knowledge in 1980. Bailey is also a classics associate professor and director of graduate studies at the University of Vermont where he studies philology, or the meanings of words and how they've evolved. A few years ago, Newsy met with the Bee Master on campus to ask him a few questions, including why almost all spelling bees use English words only. We present to you three questions with the Bee Master. Basically because in every other language I know of, if they have an alphabet, the words are spelled the way they sound. If you know Spanish, you don't really misspell words in Spanish. If you know German, you don't misspell words in German. The English expanded all over the globe and they started just sucking in words from all over. It's what we call a hypertrophied language. It's got multiple systems and nobody has really tried to control it. This is how you spell fish. Why? Well, because you want to spell the F sound with a standard way to spell the F sound, and that's in rough and tough. And you want to spell the I sound in a standard way to spell I in a common word, women, I. Now, we want to spell the SH sound with another common way to spell SH, and that's nation or ratio. So this is how we should spell fish, according to George Bernard Shaw. There's a lot of memorization. One way to know things is actually to know them. But another way to know them is to be able to figure them out. Koinonia, K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A, koinonia. That is correct. Each language has its own system. And then you realize, oh, but when we borrowed those words into English, the English didn't always follow those systems. The studying for the spelling bee for the winners is much more intense than it's ever been. They put such industry into it that it's very, very difficult to find words that they will miss. Honestly, I don't think that in high school you should be, but I think at grade school, it's that perfect moment. You discover a whole new group of what you call sight words, words that you need to know to know. They're the words that are going to unlock all the phenomena of literature. These are the words, they're doors that you can open for yourself onto the enterprise of human knowledge. And then later on, you start to use these concepts and you realize maybe the most important thing about a word is not how you spell it, it's what it means and how you use it. But first you have to know that the word exists. 
So the basic reason I love words is because they express ideas and because they're a fantastic technology. The memory of the human race is extended as far back as we can find things written down. Language is the tool with which you share and tell other people about anything. There's no other way to do it. I think it's also German like Fragen. That would work. Frankly, I think of myself as a permanent student. I'm in basically about 48th grade right now. Of all the things we call human rights, one of them should be education because it's what allows us to develop into what we want to become.